Dr. Frank Campbell travels the country working with suicide survivors. He is a nationally known consultant and award-winning expert in suicidology. He is spending Good Friday, April 3rd, hosting a session between 8.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. at Andres Banquet Center, West Avenue, Ashtabula. He will discuss what every community needs to know about sudden and traumatic death. Those interested in attending may call 992-3121 or visit www.ashtabulamhrsboard.org. Camp Bell is also assisting with the county's loss team. Two loss team members are summoned to every suicide in the county by the coroner's office to assist family and friends. Loss team members have been impacted by suicide in their own lives. In 2013, Ashtabula County had 16 suicides. In 2011, there were 23. Camp Bell sat down with the media Thursday afternoon in the commissioner's office in Jefferson to talk about his work and how it all started. But when I was 12, my best friend didn't come to school the last day of school. We found out at the end of the day that the night before he had gone home and shot himself. Our teacher shared that with us right at dismissal, and I'm sure she could have lost her job for even telling us. But as a group, none of us ever really got the story. We made up lots of stories. Back then, kids at 12 weren't allowed to go to funerals. We didn't, none of us really had information. It was right at the end of school, so we all went our own way for the summer. And still to this day, even though we joined a 7th through 12th school setting the next year, we were one of several schools. So we became now a small group within a bigger group. And today, although we've lost many other people to suicide just by having lived a long time, when we do have a class reunion, that small group of students, we all end up in a corner somewhere talking about that day. So for me, the crawfishing and the reason that night I sat in that bereavement group, it just brought back to me what it's like to have gone all those years and never got to talk about my friend's death, and today being proud to say that that's not the way it is most of the time now. That today people are able to get help in a school setting. Um, because I'm from Louisiana, we tend to crawfish into things. We kind of back in, you know. Um, I was uh, trained in clinical work and was working as an intern in a placement at a crisis center. And my very first day on the job, um, if you're in school, you're expected to know what to do. So they put me in a support group for bereaved families that had lost someone to suicide. And that night I knew this was what I wanted to do. So it was a lucky accident for me that I fell into working with suicidology. I became certified in thanatology, which is death and dying. Thantos is a Greek god of death, so from the Latin Thantos for death, thanatology is the study of death. So that also means at a party everybody moves away from it. <laughs> so, um, and it was a short line in school, we could say that. Then suicide becomes one cause of death, so field of practice is suicidology. So today I'm a forensic suicidologist and my doctorate is in clinical research around death and dying and specifically suicide. And the lost team concept, the active postvention model was what I developed during my doctoral research. So that's where the model came from. Discovery Channel did three documentaries on my death, on my work rather, over the time that I was doing this work and they went around the world and that really is what generated the international demand. So we have lost teams today from uh, diverse cultures as much as Singapore, where it's a national model, to Northern Ireland. Uh, suicide is a very high ranking cause of death globally. Uh, the CDC and the World Health Organization sometimes refer to suicide as the number two preventable cause of death on the planet. And the United States tends to rank about in the middle compared to countries who do report suicide, not all do. You would, you would think in Cuba no one has ever died by suicide, but I've been there three times and I've been to several suicides. What we found in my community was that we were in a passive position. If someone dies by suicide, that family had to stumble onto the help that was available. Uh, because of the secrecy and the lack of comfort on the topic, 
survivors tended to be less often referred and most deaths were occurring away from a hospital or somewhere like that where they might have a clinical intervention. Nationally, I read a study that showed that most people who were referred to a support group were referred by a doctor or a nurse, which means they were pronounced at a hospital. 75% of the suicides in our community were pronounced at the home or away from a facility by the coroner. So passive meant they had to find help on their own. When I looked at 10 years of people coming to that group that I started with, the average was four and a half years between the death and stumbling on to help. By the time they got help, most of them had had a long period of time with a lot of other problems developing as a result of trying to cope with this very traumatic cause of death. My hope was in starting an active postvention model is instead of it being passive, we would actively seek them so that they would just know where help is when they're ready. So to do that, we, we saw the best opportunity for that is to be at the scene while the body is still present. So we spent 10 years trying to get our coroner to let us put a team at the scene. And in 1998, a new coroner was open to that idea and we began going to scenes in December of 1998, December 18th, 1998. We went to three scenes the first night. The first scene was a sheriff's deputy who had killed himself. And the first couple that went to the scene were a, a, a former deputy sheriff himself and his wife who lost their son who had been a deputy sheriff. So this was like family coming to family. So it gave us a lot of credibility right away. <laughs> So you, you work with the relatives, the people that are left behind mostly? Really, anyone gathered at the scene. Um, we also did multiple year research. And what we found was that the number five frequency walking through the door for help. Now this means they had to be exposed to a death by suicide. They had hurt bad enough to go for help. And, in many, and since we were the crisis center that provided the bereavement, they had to walk through a building that said Crisis Intervention Center. Believe it or not, most people don't just walk in the door saying, what do you guys do? They pretty much see that as a barrier. Mm -hmm. So even though the services were free, the fear was, do I, really, do I really qualify? Do I deserve it? And the number five frequency was friend of the deceased, a non-biological, non-familial relationship. From research and David Brent's work in North Carolina, we know that the loss of a friend in high school to suicide is measured at the exact level of a sibling. So for most of us, if we actually are honest about the people in our life that are important to us, it's really more our friends and our family in a lot of cases. So friend dying by suicide creates a grief response that doesn't fit into their idea of how they ought to be. So they're saying, why am I feeling like this? It wasn't like they were my brother, my sister, my mother, my husband, my daughter, my child. But I'm, I'm having a really hard time with this. And then they come to the group and they realize there are a lot of people in there that lost a friend. And now all of a sudden they realize, well, maybe that does make sense, that this abnormal feeling I'm having is actually normal because suicide develops this reaction with friends. What happens when you have somebody like Robin Williams that kind of impacts the whole country? Suicidology began because of Marilyn Monroe's death. So our phenomenon is based, our, our field of study in America is based in the fact that when Marilyn Monroe died, the Los Angeles coroner reached out to Ed Schneidman, a local thanatologist like, like I was, and Ed was a, a friend and a mentor of mine. And Bob Lippman, who's a psychiatrist, to consult with him on suicide. Her death had such notoriety, the coroner was quite paranoid that he wasn't gonna get it right. So they were brought in. That led to Ed having access to coroner's files on suicide, which led to a whole study of suicide notes because they're so rare. Suicide notes are only left about 15% of the time in America. And so Ed, because of the Los Angeles having such a high number of deaths, could actually have a lot of notes to review because he was brought on the inside. He was brought behind the wall and allowed to read these notes. 
And that led to the theory of suicidal ambivalence, and that led to suicidology. So Marilyn Monroe's death is actually the gateway that created a whole field of practice. So I say that to say this, what we learn from all high profile suicides is that they create a temporal distribution or a gravitational pull toward that death. So when people say we're having cluster suicides, typically what's happened is someone prominent has died and it pulls almost gravitationally to that time in the world, temporally. And so you start seeing more suicides in a short period of time. You take that same year though, and you won't have any more suicides typically than you would have had on a trend. You know, take a 10 year average, you won't see a big increase in suicide. And we've learned that if you have the death of a high school student, faculty, or uh, staff, of a non-suicide, we were talking about a drowning earlier, you have a drowning of a student, if you do postvention activities, go to the school, talk to the kids, that's when your suicide risk students will pop up like toast. They'll say things like, well, that's not so bad. And they'll start to issue these invitations that suggest perhaps we should have a longer conversation with a student. So when we started going to schools and doing postvention, regardless of the cause of death, if it was sudden and traumatic, that's the time to go. And so that is another reason why generalizing sudden traumatic loss has a benefit for suicide prevention. We began to see kids that needed help, but it's especially important when you have a student that dies by suicide. With social media today, the whole student body know before most of the student faculty know. So we find postvention being a form of prevention. So if we get to the scene, if we get the people connected, what we tend to see is more people get help because they're pulled gravitationally to this cause of death. And so when Robin Williams died, it was a great time for a national conversation around suicide. What the country did is what happens routinely. As soon as somebody could lock on to a why he killed himself that was other than mental health related, that was it. Conversation stopped. Oh, he found out he had Parkinson's or oh, he, he and so people came up with this, if I had that outcome, I'd, I'd probably kill myself too. What was missed was all the treatment facilities that had treated Robin Williams over the years for drug problems, substance abuse problems, who in their history learned he had had other attempts, but never really dealt with the suicide part. They only dealt with the recovery of the drug. And then when he would relapse, he would also relapse when it comes to suicide. So I, I'm of the opinion, knowing that there is at least one training out there based on a recovery and growth model, that if people doing uh, substance abuse treatment also had a skill set around suicide, that would be more likely that people could get help with the suicide part of their life and help recovering from the substance abuse problem and then when they go back out into the world where the substances are what they were using, suicide wouldn't be the way to resolve a relapse. I, I think that's the thing that I would say about Robin's death. What, it was, what was helpful for Robin Williams' suicide to happen was people could then hear us say, well, you don't judge him by his cause of death. You look at him over his whole life and all the kind you know, People love Robin Williams. He's a great actor, a great comedian, etc. So what it did was it put a different face on suicide. It put a face on suicide that remembers that good people loved by others die by suicide. It's not some stereotype of a pathologically deranged person. It's about people hurting enough to want to die rather than live. Hopeless enough that hopefulness comes out of the thought that if I die, everyone will be better off. So it did give us a chance to reframe suicide as something that happens to wealthy people and not just poor people. People with resources, with support, can die by suicide. So it broke down some of the stereotypes that are out there that aren't accurate. A stereotype should come from reality. When it comes to suicide, it does not. It comes from books and movies and things that are fiction. We have a, a workshop tomorrow. We'll be doing quite a few things, but mainly we're going to be talking about how this community is reaching out to families and individuals affected by suicide, and the outcome is this is an active postvention model county. 
and this county is making a difference through the work of the coroner's office and the lost team here in Ashtabula County and in the different townships and then in neighboring counties as well. And all of Ohio, no state in the Union of America is doing more than Ohio to do this work. That's what I'm going to talk about. I'm the guy from down south that can come say Ohio ought to be pretty proud of what they're doing. So is this what you, you go all over the country all the time, going where you're needed, or? I, I pretty much go where I'm invited. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'd rather not just show up. Um, you'd be surprised how few people show up when nobody was there doing the front work. Uh, but, you know, this week, uh, 10 days ago I was in Key West, uh, four days later I was in Round Rock, Texas, then I was in Archbold, Ohio, and then Rootstown yesterday, and today here. Um, next Friday I'll be at Fort Campbell working with military. So um, my wife says I go anywhere. I'm, I don't even really have to be invited. They just have to look at me for a little while and I go. <laughs> but it's, it's basically my career today is to be a consultant. But to have somebody else there who's able to explain protocol, tell them what might happen, listen to them just babble about the confusion going on in their mind can be settling for that, that family that's just whirling around out of space. Um, you're not going to learn from a movie or TV what death scenes are like, because that's movies and TVs. And no two are the same. So when lost teams are trained, they're trained to be very flexible. They're like yoga masters. They can do anything that has to be done because no two scenes will be the same. And we were starting to hear about lost teams, and it just made a lot of sense that it was something that would assist the coroner's office, would assist the families, would get it, people to the services they need as early as possible, and it would be on their terms and at their choice. So we found out about a training that Dr. Campbell was doing that the foundation was sponsoring. Our board funded uh, folks to go to the training. It was, it was very reasonable, so we were able to do that. And we had seven people go to the first training. We sat down with the coroner's office. We came up with a, a protocol as to how they wanted to do this, because you remember the coroner is the lead law enforcement officer at a scene like this, so you want to work closely with them. They do the call outs for the lost team. You know, they're able to, to call when they need someone to come out. And so we just developed a protocol, and in September of 2012, we had our first uh, group of about 15 volunteers, all of them community members, all of them connected to either being a survivor of suicide or a survivor of a traumatic death, and able to connect with a family on the scene. Because this is not a mental health intervention. This is, like Dr. Campbell said, friends and neighbors who've gone through a similar thing, coming and sitting next to you, answering your questions, bringing you information, listening to you talk, which is something you desperately need at that point, because at this point, your life does not make any sense anymore. We give, we give them information of everything from the social services, because now they may, look, may be looking at, they've just lost their primary source of income, because that was their, their breadwinner. So we give them information on all the social services, we give them information on every funeral director in the county, because we have a large county. And so people live in different parts of the county, so we give them a list, because one of the first questions we learned people ask was, I've never done this before, I don't even know how to plan a funeral. So we give them that information. We give them information on how to talk to your kids, uh, what you might be feeling. We give them the, the uh, Survivor of Suicide Handbook, which kind of talks about you know, how your emotions might be roller coastering, how one person might be angry, another person might seem sad, how all of the emotions might be everywhere. All of this is normal. Trying to normalize their feelings for them. Let them know that traumatic death brings those types of feelings that make you feel like you're not normal. But that is the normalcy of the situation. So we include as much information, yeah, about the behavioral health agencies, and also the agencies that treat drug and alcohol, because because substance abuse, someone in recovery who's just lost someone in a traumatic way is at high risk for relapse. You know, you think you're going there to, to deal specifically with family members and we're shocked by how many neighbors show up and we're shocked by how many coworkers show up or, or after the fact. You know, statistically, um, in workplaces with fewer than 100 employees, um, you have a much higher risk of, of bereavement from that suicide, just like in a family. And if you look at Ashtabula County, the vast majority of our employers are small employers like that. So we're talking about a whole lot of coworkers and a whole lot of neighbors. We want, 
we want more diversity. We want to see African Americans. We want to see more men. This is our male on the team. This is it. This is it. So we, you know, we use him a lot. People who have survived. We just don't need professional people. We want people who can provide hope and 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 examples for how they can get through this. That's the most important. I think us as professionals need to defer to the survivors and let them talk because they bring great credibility and great hope to people in a very difficult situation. And contact your office if anybody would be interested, if they feel comfortable enough and wanting to start giving back and, and you know, it's a way to honor the person that they lost. You know, they're gonna help someone else through it. Yes, we, none of us can ever know how we are perceived by the people we come to the door. But I can tell you how the survivors are perceived. They grab them, they hold on to them, they hug them when they leave, because they know they're here volunteering their time to help somebody who knows what it's like to be suddenly thrown into that frozen lake out there with no idea which way to go. And so the ego neutral is probably the biggest challenge we all have in finding folks that can set aside the only really important thing is that we do the lost team job and we stay with that. It's not a time for counseling. It's not a time for any of those things that maybe credentials are about. It's really a time for what to me is one of the most powerful interventions mankind has available, listening. 